So, uh, good evening. Thanks for coming tonight. Great to see a great turnout. We uh, are located on Treaty 6 territory, uh, the traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Dene, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities. So the format for this evening will be, we'll have uh, Melissa Bruntlett um, speaking first, followed by Daniel Vrend. First up, we'll have Melissa from uh, Modacity and Urban Systems. First off, thanks uh, Harrison for organizing this and for the Urban Systems uh, Vibrant Community Speaker Series this is a part of. So tonight, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the book that I've written with my husband called Building the Cycling City. I'm going to share some lessons with you, uh, give some insight into how the Dutch have achieved the cycling culture that they have in that small European nation. You can't really tell the cycling story without having actually experienced the best that cycling has to offer, and that's what took us to the Netherlands in 2016. I want everyone here to close their eyes or keep them open, whatever you want to do, and imagine your daily commute, and now see what it looks like for the Dutch. As we started to delve into just what, may, like how cycling had permeated the entire con uh, country, uh, what we started to realize was that cycling is pretty prominent, not just in the big centers like Amsterdam, Rotterdam, but it's, it's common throughout the country. The one thing is that the Dutch don't seem to celebrate that very often, which is why we then came to start telling that story for them. Bringing those ideas back onto this shore, we get the same sort of pushback uh, that can't happen here. Our city's different. The Dutch, you know, there's, there's just something about it that makes them different. We can't bring that here. The other myth we hear is, well, they don't get the same winters. And I'm sure that there are people here when you talk about cycling that have that same argument. They don't get the winters that we get here in Edmonton. You know, anyone in the Netherlands could tell you that the winds coming off the North Sea all year round and the weather that they get is just as brutal. It's because they've been given safe space to cycle that they actually cycle all year round, no matter the, what the weather throws at them. And so it's not because they're altruistic. It's not because it's flat. It's not because the weather's different. It's just because they've actually been given a nationwide network of cycling infrastructure completely separated from the streets. What's important to remember is that a lot of this infrastructure was actually only built in the last 20 to 30 years and it's continually being built and adapted as uh, their cities grow, as demands change. And the other thing that the Dutch do quite well is properly investing in cycling. Uh, we often hear in North America that we want to reach certain mode shares, but we're not willing to necessarily put the same investment behind reaching those numbers. The Dutch, um, in the last stat that we found, spent about, spend about 30 euros per person per year on cycling, which equates to about $50 Canadian per year. And while that number varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, smaller towns probably spending a little more or a little less than bigger cities like Edmonton or Vancouver, the number is about $5 per person here in Canada, which is one-tenth of what they're spending over there. I don't want everyone to sit here and think that the Dutch have always had this cycling utopia that's always been this way. And that's often the misconception is that a lot of these European cities that are very good for cycling have just always been that way. And the reality is very, very different from that. Um, and a lot of the streets that we experience today when we travel to the Netherlands are the result of heavy citizen activism. Uh, regular people standing up and asking for better cities. In, this, in the 50s and 60s, much like here in North America, they started to dabble in their own versions of motorization, widening streets, raising neighborhoods to build space for cars, thinking that was the future. And in places like Amsterdam, which is on the screen here, as this started to happen, residents started to push back and realize this is not the city that they wanted. And through that citizen activism, Amsterdam that you see today is starkly different uh, and could have gone in a very different direction. But because the citizens pushed back, we can now go there and the citizens that live there can enjoy these spaces that are for people as opposed to cars. I want uh, the message to be that there is hope for what's happening here in North America. And so in this presentation and also in our book, we look at examples of where a lot of these ideas are starting to come to our shores. So looking at political bravery, um, 
one of the cities that stood out to us is our hometown. Uh, we moved to Vancouver in 2007 and just after that saw the election of Mayor Gregor on a pro-bike platform. It was through his insistence and the insistence of the Vision Council that cycling be made a priority that our city has seen the changes that it has. Through that, they just kept moving strength on strength, putting uh, more and more, a, almost a complete network in our downtown now and building out those cycle tracks outside of the city. We now have three fully protected Dutch style intersections where you know there's no longer that stress that a lot of us experience when we're traveling through intersections on a bike. But through all this, it's really important to remember that uh, just because a city has been a certain way for 50 years doesn't mean we can't change it. When we were looking for a Dutch, Dutch example of that, uh, Rotterdam immediately stood out. Uh, for those that don't know Rotterdam's history, they were the unfortunate recipients of some very heavy, heavy bombing during the Second World War when the Germans were trying to get the Dutch to capitulate. And unfortunately, although they had surrendered, uh, the German forces did not appropriately communicate with their bombers and the city center was completely destroyed save that one cathedral you can see in the top left. So following the war, following the tragedy, and you know, as sad as they were, planners, engineers saw this as a huge opportunity. Now we have this completely blank slate. We can design the city in Robert Moses' idea of bringing wide streets and tall buildings to our city center that no other Dutch city can experience because they, didn't, they don't have the blank slate that we do. But as with the rest of the country in the 70s, uh, residents started to see that what they were being sold was not what they wanted. Um, coupled with the 1973 OPEC oil crisis when suddenly driving was less desirable because of the cost of oil, the city had to start rethinking how they were designing uh, the city and how they were allocating space um, to make sure that they were building a city that would be sustainable for the future. So nowadays Rotterdam looks incredibly different from that modernist plan, um, but that was by using the space that had been created. So those wide streets were transformed to have luscious green tramway tracks down the center of a lot of their main streets leading to a, um, one of the busy, well, a very busy transit hub. And on the sides of those streets, they built ample wide cycle tracks that can connect you to pretty much everywhere in the city very intuitively. They've done a lot, obviously, to build cycling into the everyday, but they're not done. They're always trying to find ways to improve. So now we kind of come full circle and, you know, we really are at a, a crossroads in a lot of American cities of deciding the future that we want. I would much rather see uh, cities where we're prioritizing people and children being able to travel around of their own volition in a safe and comfortable way. Um, a lot of North American cities are already on their way. I would say I've now had the opportunity to cycle around Edmonton and I would say that Edmonton is getting there as well. But that doesn't, doesn't mean we, have to, we can stop communicating the importance of building healthy, happy and inclusive cities for people. The message I want to leave you with is that while the Dutch have had a 50-year head start, it doesn't mean that it's unattainable. It doesn't mean that we can't bring that here. And as some Ameri North American cities are showing, it is possible to bring a lot of those ideas to our cities in a way that makes sense for us. Um, and we can often learn from their mistakes and avoid them. The one last thought I will leave you with is just um, an adjustment to an Ch old Chinese proverb that says, the best time to build a cycle track was 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Melissa. That was a great presentation. Uh, so next up, we'll have Daniel Friend, uh, General Supervisor of Urban Places with the City of Edmonton, to give the city's perspective on cycling. Thanks. Um, so generally, I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our journey here in Edmonton and how, how we got to where we are. In 1992, we had a bike transportation plan that focused on um, some basic uh, improvements to cycling in Edmonton. It was wide shared use, uh, or sorry, wide uh, curb lanes for riding your bike side by side motor vehicles. Around that time, we had about, in around 95, 1995, we had about 25,000 people a day cycling uh, for the daily trip in Edmonton, and that was about 0.7 of the trips. 2001, we had a multi-use corridor trail study, and that was focused on building shared use paths and largely pipeline right-of-ways. Uh, 
Um, we hadn't invested, um, I, don't, I think it's fair to say we had invested very little money in cycling infrastructure up until this point, and so the focus was really on stretching the dollar. So we started um, in that, uh, that approach in adding some bike lanes um, that you know, largely looked something like this, um, paint, um, in when other construction programs were happening. So we were rehabilitating a neighborhood. I don't know if you get it already, but what the bike is a play on some salty language. Um, <laughs> Um, it started with uh, we biked up um, in terms um, in terms of our apology campaign, and it was around that time as well that there seemed that there became a really consistent and a really consistent um, message from residents and from council of of some uh, harsh and fair criticism on on our implementation strategy. So in 2014, the city administration came up with a, a new approach, a new approach for engagement. Um, that in, you know, went from, hey, by the way, some bike lanes are coming in front of your house basically next week, to a six-stage process where you got, we started with, you know, we, we think some bike lanes should be in this area, where should they go, right down to um, opportunities for landscaping, opportunities for small, you know, parklets, all the, all the other stuff, what color paint do you want your benches? Um, it was a six-stage fairly involved um, process there. And, and to focus on, um, at that time, on, on core neighborhoods as well. We said instead of going neighborhood by neighborhood with our, with our uh, citywide routes, we're going to focus on the core in areas where people are already cycling uh, to show that we have some use and, and build on some success that we are having in core areas and, and build out from there. Probably a lot of people in this room um, went from uh, what was an $8 million project to $5 million a year uh, for the active transportation budget, so $20 million for that, and another, another 13 for the 102 Ave bike lane plus, um, plus the 83rd, so pretty significant result there. But again, there was some frustration that um, was taking, and probably again, a lot of people in this room were involved, uh, but there's a significant frustration the amount of time that it was taking. We're looking at five or six years for these projects from inception or improve approval of the budget till when they might, might open. And so there, as a result of some push from, from some advocates, um, council passed a motion asking administration to look at implementing a downtown, a downtown bike grid, which again, there was some news and got to talk to the media a bunch. And so that, that happened in the span of you know, 11 months to go from that motion to, you know, you, you may have taken your bike here today, there's one of the routes outside. Um, and so 2017 and 2018 and beyond, there's, um, there's more, um, yeah, more to come. So which leads me largely to, I mean, really why I'm here, which is to plug for some input into a process that the city is leading, and as well, maybe, you know, some, some processes that administration may not be leaving, leading, but for you to be involved in, in pushing for, for your vision for the city. And there's also been some pretty um, interesting, and I would say noteworthy and useful and helpful smaller changes that have been made to bike routes as a result of advocacy as well, and um, yeah, I've had conversations and worked with some of you in the room around some of those as well. Things like moving a bike lane, a lane um, Shirdi's path around a, a tree that meant a lot to a family, um, adding a seating node in a, in a place where across from a senior's residence that was really important for them to be able to have a rest, um, adding some community notice boards around, um, around some of these seating nodes so that the community can, can can feel more connected and help organize and, and create events. Um, some, oh, what was my last example? Sorry. And uh, yeah, addition of traffic calming elements to make an, a community more uh, more livable. It's not about moving people. It's about uh, building a better city or a better community and, and fitting that in. And flowers are a great way to do that. So we have this opportunity with the bike plan coming up. Um, it's a, we want to update the 2009 plan. We recognize that we've we probably got some things right, um, but have a lot to learn. Um, it's time to, to build a vision that we can coalesce around and hopefully um, move, continue to move forward around, coalesce around a vision, rather than move in fits and starts and, um, and uh, like we have in the past, over the past 10 years. Um, everybody here, I would, I would say, has a pretty valuable and personal experience with cycling and we hope that you're willing and uh, able to share it with us so that we can build a plan that we can collectively uh, coalesce around and, and move forward. So on our bike plan, we have a few phases of engagement um, going forward. 
Um, the first phase is, is basically around asking what cycling should look like in Edmonton. Um, talking about trade-offs in the spring, how to focus our priorities. Um, should, we, should we implement a bike network that's done as cash efficiently as possible, spread about the city? Should we focus on, on core areas? Should we focus on building rights out to the suburbs or to our neighbors or whatever it is? Um, we're looking for implementation and trade-offs. Um, and for the fourth, we're looking for um, goals and activities we should focus on to meet our vision. So in the last slide, we have a number of engagement opportunities, and you're lucky enough that we have an engagement opportunity right here today. So a non-shameless plug to go walk on our large map here and, and talk with some city staff and, and help us understand what your, um, how best to shape, have cycling shape the city that we want to live in. And the pieces in green here, they're not quite random, and it's not quite a screw up on which element, which dates here are green. The green, um, are part of Engage Edmonton, which is also an opportunity to provide feedback on our upcoming capital budget. So it's a four-year capital budget. Now is a great time to provide some input on, on how you feel um, to, to the city and we'll shape, um, yeah, we'll shape our budget for the next, uh, next capital cycle. So the gray ones, just cycling, maybe some other events. Green ones, cycling and budget. Show up to all of them. <laughs> Okay, really don't. We have many opportunities for you to, to share. So with that, that's everything that I had, and I'm hoping that uh, everybody can take a few moments after we're done the Q&A to circulate with us and provide your input and feedback so that we can you know, learn from your valuable experiences. Thanks.